Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Pat. I'm a grateful alcoholic. Hi, Pat. Please excuse my voice. I've got a bad cold. We come from the north, and it's cold up there. Uh, I want to thank the committee uh, for inviting my husband and I here, and uh, John, our hostess, and um, (laughs) our host, (laughs) and uh, Victor for all the letters and phone calls back and forth for getting us here. We we enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Um, As I said, uh, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I came in these rooms in 1980, April the 29th, 1980. I'll be coming up on 25 in this April. Thank you. And you can clap for yourselves because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people like you in these rooms that kind of pushed me along and stayed with me through the whole thing. Um, I did my drinking down here. Uh, A lot of you will know this. I did my drinking in North Beach and Chesapeake Beach. Where else can you have a good time? You roll out of one bar into another. And uh, uh, it took me down many strange things. Um, I I didn't drink for a long time. I didn't drink much growing up in my teens or in my 20s. I didn't start drinking until in my middle 30s. And I have to tell you that um, I truly believe that the little bottle sits right here on my shoulder and just waits very patiently for me because he did all those years. And when I picked up my first, my drink, um... It was like I had been drinking all along. I would have started right where I would have been if I had been drinking the whole time. Uh, I went to, as I said, I started drinking in North Beach. My oldest daughter had left home to uh, go live with a motorcycle guy in North Beach. We had disowned her, so I was going to bring her home. And uh, I was a typical PTA mother. We had a nice home. My husband had a good job. We belonged to the country club. We had horses. And so he worked in evenings, and I took off to to bring my daughter home. To this day, I could not tell you if we ever talked about that. When I met her, I met her at the bar. I drank at the bar. I don't remember from the very beginning of ever talking to her about coming home. Or I don't remember a lot of times when I did come home. I don't remember how I came home, but I swear to this day that when I went to North Beach, all the people went out and moved their their mailboxes closer to the road because I always had a dent or a scratch in my car. Um, I uh, it was a, it was a exciting world for me. I can't say uh, I didn't like it at first because it was totally different from the life I had led. It was um, loud music. Um, there were men there that gave you many compliments, and there was a pool table, and I learned to shoot pool good. I belonged to the uh, Blackie and Lil's pool uh, thing. If anyone remembers that. Black and Lil's. I, I know when I quit drinking, it, it closed down, really. Um, I started wearing tight clothes, tight jeans, high heel boots, tear tees to the hilt, makeup on. And I'd go in there, and I could, after a couple of beers, I could dance better, sing better, talk better on any subject, and do anything you wanted, and shoot pool. And then I got violent. Then I got nasty, and I would get into fights, and I'd come home and not know where I got this busted lip or this bruise or why my blouse was ripped or what. I don't remember too much. I do remember toward the end that um, 
And my daughter never came home, by the way. Um, I do remember toward the end that um, I told my husband, of course, he kind of found out he'd come home early one night, and I didn't come home till after last call. And uh, we started having problems at home as well. And I said to him, I got to get away. I got to go away from you, away from everybody, and I got to think this out. Because I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought I had another personality, and that personality was taken over, and I was starting to get hurt a lot because I was getting in fights with men as well. And uh, I just knew I was going to end up dead. But I didn't know how to stop this. I really didn't. And I was so worried about it, and I was so scared. So I packed up a little bag, and I went to North Beach and got me a room. My daughter and her bunch would come over, and we'd party hardy. About four days later, I'm sitting in the living room of this place, and I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at the people around me, and I'm looking at everything, and I'm wondering... Where am I? What the hell is going on here? And I went into the bedroom and I sat down and I said, Dear God, I can't go on like this. I can't embarrass my children and my family or anything. I am just, you know, something has taken over and I am evil. And down then when we had horses and all, I also carried a gun. And, uh, I sat there and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to embarrass my children. I'm going to get arrested. Something's going to happen to me. And if I wasn't here, maybe my family would come together. And I took that gun and I put a pillow to my stomach and I shot myself. That bullet ricocheted in and out of my intestines. I carry that bullet today in my right hip. I ended up at shock trauma. They cut me from one end to the other, laid my guts out on the table, and sewed me up. And they told my husband, I don't think she's going to come back in one piece or have all her facilities with her. And I did. Nine days later, I woke up. And I was okay. And if that ain't a miracle, I don't know what is. As I laid there in the bed... Father Alexis and brother, brother Alexis and, and Father Martin were doing a tour of the Baltimore um, tra- uh, trauma unit. And uh, the nurse, which was a male nurse that took care of us because he had to turn us over and everything, told him about me. And these two priests came into my room and they started talking about alcohol and what alcohol did to them and where it took them. And I had been raised Catholic, so I, of course I sat up and paid attention. And um, I thought, oh, my God, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not crazy. I'm not two different people. I don't need to be put away. I just need to stop to drink. I'd like to say, or I would like to say at that time, I came into the program that I stayed, but I didn't. When I went home from the hospital, I was there for about a couple of months, and things didn't work out. So I left and moved in with a person in AA, a female. And um, we didn't have much. We didn't have no heat, nothing. But we had coffee. We had um, um, potted meat, mayonnaise, and lettuce. But we always had coffee, and whoever had money would put gas in whoever's car, and we would use that. And we would go to anniversaries so we could get food to bring home, because we didn't have nothing. And in the wintertime, we slept with all our clothes on and our boots and everything all together in one bed. And uh, that was a rough year. But I went to a meeting every night. I had a good sponsor. I had good people. And I don't know why I didn't think I was too bad or whatever. I don't know why I went back out. But I do know that I went to court to get custody of my daughter, my youngest daughter. My oldest was still out there somewhere. 
and the judge said I was an alcoholic he could not be trusted and my daughter was better off where she was I left that courtroom very angry very mad now the whole time I was in AA I memorized the book I me- remember I memorized these papers I could sit there at a meeting and t- round them off like anything and I went to a meeting every day sometimes twice a day but I didn't let anyone get close to me I didn't let anyone know Pat so when I came out of that courtroom and my sponsor and a couple of the ladies were there from the program I told them what they could do with their program now at that time I was working at the uh, nuclear power plant down there in security and it was the outage and they had a great big parties all the time and I went to one of these parties I can't tell you when I picked up that drink or what happened all I know is I went to the bathroom fell off the toilet got up looked in the mirror and I was drunk I couldn't tell you 3 days later where my car was where I was but you know where I ended up at an AA meeting I walked into that AA meeting 3 days later with a six pack under one arm and a bottle of beer in the other drunker than a scoot and I went in there and I let them know how mad I was and how angry I was and I had stopped drinking for a year why did they take my daughter from me I don't know too much of what happened after that but I know I woke up about 17 hours later and I was in a strange bed in a strange place I didn't know and I looked out the window where the bed was and there was a church across the way and there was a cross on the church and I said dear god please get me out of this please I don't know where I am and at that time I heard somebody say oh you're awake would you like a cup of coffee and I looked up and it was someone from AA they had taken me home to their home they had cleaned me up and they had put me to bed in a nice clean bed it took me i'm ashamed to say two weeks before i walked through the doors of AA again i was so embarrassed and so humiliated and that was april the 29th that i walked into those rooms 1980 and i haven't seen it a reason to take a drink today and i got a new sponsor and i got a tough sponsor and she was tough she took me through the steps she took me she made me go make coffee she made me do a lot of things i didn't want to do she made me stand up in meetings she made me tell people how i felt and God bless her she's dead today but um she was a great lady and she guy had a, a support group she had a group of girls she sponsored and we all just hung together she took me to Loyola my first women's retreat and all i could remember from that weekend was wow i spent a whole weekend with 75 women and we didn't fight <laughs> and it was terrific I see a few people here that knew me when I first came in this program that uh live still live down in North Beach or down near that way um and uh I kind of lost my train of thought here <laughs> but anyways um I stayed with this group of women and we we did everything together and one day Everything was very quiet. Everything was very calm. The sun was shining. I had my own little apartment then cuz my sponsor pushed me to work and to do this and do that. And I thought, "Oh my god, it's quiet. What's going on?" I called my sponsor in a panic and I said, "Nothing's happening. It's so quiet." And she says, "That's serenity. Enjoy it." and I couldn't believe it I was scared I was waiting for the other bomb to drop really um 
My sponsor told me that it was time for me to move on. And uh, she said it was time for me to get out of Calvert County and North Beach area. That it was time for me to get a job that had security, had health benefits, and everything. And I want to tell you something. This was like three years later, and I kept asking her every year when I had an anniversary, can I date now? And she said, oh, no, you're too sick. No, no, we have to get you well first. You have to be able to take care of yourself before you do anything. So that's what happened. And so I went, and she told me they needed some uh, women in, in uh, up at the Annapolis Complex to protect the senators and delegates and the governor and everything. And she says, I want you to apply for it. And I said, oh, my God, I can't do that. I'm too old. She said, oh, no. You don't fail if you try. If you don't get it, you haven't failed because you tried. It's just not meant for you to have right now. But you can't go anywhere if you don't get out there and do something. And she told me this, and she kept telling me this. and So I took the test, and I passed it. And I moved to Annapolis. And I started working. Now, here's a drunk who shot herself, who a judge said was unfit to have her own child. And here I am protecting the senators and delegates and governor of Maryland. And I said, wow. And uh, I continued to, uh, to go to a lot of meetings up there. She took me up first and introduced me to everybody at the meetings. And she got me started. And she got me a sponsor who was her sponsor before. So I would have someone when I moved there to talk to. This is what these people did for me. They were there when my husband would tell me I could have my daughter for the weekend and he would come and take her away because he said he couldn't trust me. Or when he stole my car when it was parked outside of, the, of a meeting or my job. I had to fight for every little thing, and she was there. Her and, and the rest of the girls were there all the time, and they helped me through it all. I uh, had my youngest daughter was dumped on my doorstep at the age of 13. She was a drug addict, and she was pregnant. So we had to take care of the pregnancy. To this day, I still pray to God that I'm so sorry, but she was only 13, and I had to put her away so she could get well, and I sent her away to Kifa. And when we got to court and the judge wanted her to come home, I said no, not without counseling and help. And she yelled at me, and she screamed at me in that courtroom, and she said she hated me, and I was the worst mother in the world. And it was like someone had taken my heart and thrown it out the window. I was so hurt by it. But I knew I had to stand my ground. I could not help my child. I had to turn her over to someone else. I was too close. And I would enable her to continue what she was doing. When my daughter, youngest daughter, graduated from high school, she walked across the stage and she raised her diploma and she says, Ma, this is for you. So about then, I had been still going to a lot of meetings, talking to my sponsor, had done my steps several times over. I was a GSR. I made coffee at the meetings. I helped cleaned up. And they had a little place in Annapolis called the Red House. And I would go there when I got off work in the morning, and I would answer the phones for 12-step calls or whoever needed help. And then I would go home and get some rest, get up and go to work, and go home and change clothes and get up and go to work, because I always had two to three jobs. I bought my own home, new home. I bought a brand-new car. I had credit. I had everything. And I had the best friends in the world. 
About that time when my daughter had graduated, I said to God, well, it's been over 14 years, God, and uh, my kids are all growing up now, and if I'm to have somebody in my life, you're going to have to hit me over the head with a two-by-four because I don't know what to do anymore. So I go to Ocean City for the convention, and I meet this man named Junk from Massachusetts, and we get to talking. With him is my, my husband today, and um, he went, Junk went and told him, I got a girl you got to meet. She's with the state police. She protects the governor and senators and delegates, and she's been celibate for 14 years. And my husband's ears went up. <laughs> so one night we're sitting there around the Plym Plaza, and then he comes and he sits down next to me. He picks up my leg, puts it in his lap, and says, let you and I talk about sex and sobriety. <laughs> When I got back home, I told my sponsor what this man did, and he did. He made me laugh all weekend. I thought he was nuts, really. And she said, you write him a thank you note. I thought she was nuts. So I did. I wrote to him, and he wrote me back. And we started corresponding, and he invited me up to, to Maryland for Junk's uh, 32nd anniversary, I took my girlfriend with me because I, I was, a, I'm, I'm the one of these people that I go the same route. I know there's shortcuts, but I go the straight route. Uh, I go to the same meetings. I do the same thing. I just don't like change. So I keep it as simple as I can. But I went across four state lines to see this man. <laughs> and my God's got a big sense of humor. He put these blinders on me. Now, I was a neat freak. Everything in order. I'm an organizer. That's why God won't take me right now, because I'll reorganize things. But anyways, I went up there. I pulled in this yard. And I, we had a nice weekend. Then he came down, brought his daughter, and some friends and back and forth, and I got injured at work really bad. I lost both my kneecaps and part of my back, and my spine and my stomach and all, and um, I was going to have surgery up in Baltimore, I mean up in um, Holyoke in Massachusetts. My husband said, well, you can, you know, come stay with me. And I said, oh, I can't do that. I'm almost 50 years old. I, I No, I don't know, no. I, you know, you don't do that. I'm sober today. <laughs> what does that mean? And he says, all right, we'll get married. I said, okay. <laughs> he says, when do you want to get married? I said, oh, next month. He said, okay. <laughs> when do you want to get married? I said, oh, in the middle of the month, around the 16th. He said, okay. He says, so we're going to get married October the 16th. I said, okay. I go back down to to Maryland, and I get this phone call from him. He's got the 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 hall. He's got the preacher. He's got the pictures taker. He's going for his blood test, and I said, "Oh my God, I got to get busy." Now, I had to get divorced first. <laughs> So, you know, I don't like to change things. So I, I called up the commissioner, got the papers signed, went over and got him to sign them. Next morning, I went, well, next evening when I went back to work, I was divorced. Then I had to explain it to him. And he took it very well, I must say. He took it real well. But my husband does not want to take things too good. But um, we got married. Uh, by being injured, they had taken me off the active list. And 
they forgot to put me on the inactive list. So they deleted me from the computer. I didn't exist. I'm up there having surgery, getting married to a new husband. I come home, and I got bills bounced left and right. I had had no checks for over three months. I couldn't believe it. It took a good lawyer a year to put me back on the books for me to get my money and all, but by then I had lost my home, lost my car, lost my credit, lost everything. And I said to my sponsor, why? Why is this happening after all this time? I worked hard. I helped. I did everything. Why? And she says, I don't know why, she says, but I know there's a reason, and you just have to trust it's going to be okay. At the same time, my husband lost his job. We had no money, nothing. I had to go and get help at the uh, social services or welfare, what do you want to call it? And I was so humiliated. I would come home and cry because I felt so degraded and so humiliated. And I would go to a meeting and they would sit there and talk to me. And I got a good support group up there, a bunch of women. We we, we had pajama parties. We had, you know, we'd get together and go places and do things. And they were there. They were there to help me through this. They brought me food. They left things on our porch. They even loaned us their car to come to the the convention one year and took up a collection. That's what AA has done. That's what the people in here are. That's what they've done for me. During that time, I get a call. It's from my daughter, my youngest. She's in jail. And I said, you're in jail. And she says, I'm going to, I'm going to prison. Now, she had become a firefighter, full-fledged woman firefighter. And I said, what happened? They had a big fire, and she went out, had a few drinks with the guys afterwards. Ex-boyfriend had come in, and they got into a fight, and she stabbed them. Didn't, thank God, he didn't have to be hospitalized or anything. He had to take a couple stitches, but he left town because he would have gotten in trouble because he was on probation and couldn't be out there drinking and carrying on. I couldn't help my daughter. I didn't have any money. I couldn't even come home. And neither could my husband. And they gave her a court-appointed person, and my daughter went to jail. When we were able to to come back, I came down to see her, and I walked into that that jail, and I walked in that room, and they ushered the prisoners in. She was behind this glass. She was all beat up. She got into it with the guards, and she wouldn't come out from under the bed, and they would hit her with sticks and everything to make her come out. And she was defiant and tried to fight him and everything, and she got hit good. She had a black eye and a busted mouth and a broken jaw, and, oh, God, and I couldn't touch my baby. When I left there, I went outside, and I just collapsed on the steps with all this barbed wire around me. And I called an AA person, and I talked to them. And I think she's in this room tonight. I knew her when she came in, and I knew the trouble she went through. And we've been friends all these years, and we sponsored each other through thick and thin. And she went to the jail and she worked with my daughter, and she took her out of that jail and would take her to meetings and then take her home. This is AA working. 
like that, one to another. My daughter got out of jail early because she was pregnant. She went to a home for unwed mothers. Thank God it was a nice place. It was a nice family, and they took in these girls that needed help. She gave birth to twins, little boy and little girl, and they're my grandchildren, and they're just the jewel of my eye. She's uh, doing really well. She's married now to the father of those children, and uh, she's doing good. My oldest daughter is married, and has two, I have two grandchildren with her, and she's doing good. God works in such mysterious ways. And he's been so good to me. I've gone through a lot of operations. I've had bones transplanted in my neck. I have no feeling in my hands. Last November, I almost died. They transferred me up to Boston. I don't remember the transfer. I don't remember my husband. I don't remember anything. My husband and I also had to go into bankruptcy. We also lost our our van. But you know what? I didn't have to take a drink. I had the support. I called down here to Maryland, talked to John or or, uh, Ron or somebody if I couldn't get anybody up home. And, uh, They've just been, everyone's just been right there for me all the way. And I haven't found it necessary to take a drink. I just had surgery, had some tumors removed, and they were cancerous, but they got most of it out of my leg. I still have some more operations to go through. God knew what he did. My husband and I are as different as day and night. Six months after we were married, people, I stood out in front of the yard. Now, my husband's Polish. He's a Polak. (laughs) And he collects everything. If there's anything on the side of the road, my husband's going to pick it up. (laughs) Except women. But he... uh, I got, it looks like a junkyard. It really does. We live in the old 17th century church that he built rooms in. It's very comfortable. We're very relaxed. We're right in the heart of town, but you really can't see us because we're surrounded by trees. And uh, I stood out there, and I looked around, and I looked at all this stuff. I mean, I'm talking like 32 sinks, 17 tubs, 350 windows that don't even belong to us. I mean, stuff everywhere. It took me 17 dumpsters to clean just the front yard corner. But... Uh, I looked around and I said, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Where? What in the world? See, God had those blinders on. But the reason I married my husband is I saw something in him I had not seen in a lot of people except my daddy. I saw a caretaker. And he has taken care of me through many, many operations. We have leaned on each other through support. I have gone, gotten beaten down so many times, and I have sat there in the middle of the floor, and I know some of you have gone through this, where whether it was welfare or your job or an insurance or something. Everything's fine. Oh, we need one more paper. And you go through looking for that one more paper. And then you say, is that it? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, wait a minute, we need this paper. And you'd sit down and go through all these papers, and I wouldn't be able to find them, and I'd be sitting in the middle of the floor with all these papers around me and tears coming down. And my husband would say, hey, come on, get up. And I'd get up, and he'd take my arm and take me out and put me in the car. And we had, what was that old Chevy? We had an old 52 Chevy or 48 Chevy? 69 Chevy pickup. And he, we'd, go, we'd go for a ride. He'd take me away from it. And every time I've been in the hospital, he has been there. Every time I've had surgery, he has sat there and waited for me to come through it. He knows more about me 
then I think I know about myself because he goes to the doctors with me and he asks questions and he listens. Oh, uh, we get, I'll tell you, we get in some good ones. We do. Don't think it's all roses because we're both strong, stubborn people. But he takes care of me. And he makes plaques and things for AA, and we do what we can. We try to give back what you've given to us. And you know I could never pay back what you people have done for me and how you've kept me going and how you keep me going today. I want you all to meet my husband, Stash. I'm very proud of him and my a lot of friends here. Turkey Man, I've known since I've been in the program. My girlfriend, Jackie, the one I was telling you about, she's in here somewhere. Where are you, Jackie? I know you're here. There she is. And we just, you know, if you stick to this program, if you listen to your sponsor, if you learn to take care of yourself before you try to take care of someone else, do please give yourself a chance to learn who you are and do the steps and do service and get a group Get a support group and stay together and work at that. Life becomes very simple. We've had our ups and downs. Life deals us a bowl of crap every now and then. But, you know, I don't have to drink over it. You know, if I drank, I don't think anything would have gotten done. If I drank, I'd probably still be sitting in the middle of the floor doing what I was doing before. But today, I can take care of first things first. I can clean up the mess. I can go through it. And it's because you help me. You give me information. You take me down to where I have to go. You're there when I need you. I don't like going to the hospital. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm like a slut, an important person. Uh, when I go to the hospital because I get a lot of visitors. I get a lot of people come see me. And that's why I give you my last name because if I'm in the hospital down here, I want you to know who I am so you can find me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone to the hospital and say, John? And then you say, they say, John who? Oh, my God, I've known him for years. I don't know his last name. Does that sound weird? So, but anyways, I want to thank you for bringing me here. Is my time up? And um, I don't want to keep you too long because a lot of you may not smoke, but I do. (laughs) (laughs) But anyways, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I may not know some of you, but you're my friends that I haven't met yet. And because you're here... I'm here, and I've made it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.